Welcome. Um, if you can see me here, my name is Gabrielle Oates. I'm here representing the Educating All Learners Alliance, or EALA, or ELA, as we like to call it. Um, and so we are excited to host this webinar today in partnership with Miami Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, so just to get a few logistics covered first, um, well, uh, the, this session uh, will be recorded. Um, and yeah. so I saw that. And so also, if you cool. could all we're getting yourselves, that would be helpful. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, and so this session will be recorded and we will be posting it on uh, YouTube, both ELA and Miami Lighthouse's platforms. So for anyone who registered but wasn't able to attend the live session, or if you would like to share this with any of your colleagues afterwards, you will be able to do so. So never fear. Um, but yeah, welcome. So just to share with you briefly about the Educating All Learners Alliance. Um, and so ELA was created in response to the pandemic as we saw there would be a gap in services provided for students with disabilities um, in a remote setting. And so we've now continued on as schools have transitioned into hybrid um, and in-person settings, school settings for many to continue to promote best practices um, and tips and tricks for educators in this space. Um, and so we are happy to have Miami Lighthouse as one of those partner organizations. And we've grown to be a group of over 80 um, in a dynamic alliance. We call it an uncommon alliance. Um, and you'll see on the screen there, we have six founding partner organizations in this group. Um, but for today, like I said, we would like to highlight one in particular, which is Miami Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired to talk about um, what we hope for, for the future of instruction for these students. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Virginia Jacko. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. It's just a year ago that Miami Lighthouse joined Educating All Learners Alliance. We've learned a lot, we've shared a lot, and it's an opportunity for us to be able to do this today. I am Virginia Jackal, President and CEO of Miami Lighthouse for the Blind and President of Miami Lighthouse Academy. I am totally blind. About 20 years ago, I lost my eyesight. I relocated to Miami to become a client of Miami Lighthouse for the Blind as a vocational rehabilitation client. I wanted to be able to use a computer again. I needed to learn screen reading software. I needed to be certain that I had access to information. I needed independent living skills. How do you do your hair? How do you do your makeup? I learned braille and so much more. But the one lesson that is the biggest takeaway from that I created a motto. It is possible for a blind person to do anything a sighted person does. They just need to know how to do it a little differently. And that's what we're talking about today. With our amazing team, we have Florian Achital, who is an orientation mobility specialist and a vision rehabilitation therapist on our Miami Lighthouse team. We have Demetrius Morgan, Demi is her nickname. She is a Florida licensed teacher of the visually impaired and an orientation mobility specialist. And we have Francesca Fitzgerald, who is a teacher of the visually impaired and a true national expert on children diagnosed with CVI. So Florian, you take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much Virginia, for that introduction. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about right now is just to cover what will be discussed today during our presentation. Uh, we'll be covering the most common visual diagnoses uh, for children and the effects of the, the, these diagnoses on students, your role and the professionals that will collaborate with you in the future and how technology and the advancement of technology 
has helped individuals and students who are visually impaired. There are going to be some acronyms that are going to be uh, heard during the presentation today. Uh, those acronyms are O&M, which stands for Orientation and Mobility. We'll be discussing that uh, career profession and instruction later on. VRT, which stands for Vision Rehabilitation Therapy, and TVI, which stands for Teacher of the Visually Impaired. Right now, I'm going to pass it along to Demi. Hi, everyone. I'm Demi. Um, very quickly, we'd like to do a question poll, so if you could all take a minute to answer the question. The question is, are you currently working with blind and or visually impaired learners? Just to quickly jump in, so the poll is currently reflecting that 54% um, oh now 57% of people who have answered the poll don't directly work with blind learners, but their work does support them. And then second is yes, that you do directly work with blind or visually impaired <sighs> learners. That's interesting. Thank you all for answering. We uh, will use that information throughout the session, but that is interesting info. All right, into our first slide. So what is a visual impairment? So a visual impairment is a loss of vision that cannot be corrected with glasses or contact lenses. Now these visual aids, they may help a student see better, but they will not cure a visual diagnosis. So for each state, the laws are different. So I won't say any laws, but each the laws are different for students and how they qualify for a visual impairment. And there's also a range of visual impairments which will be discussed soon. Uh, where there are five com most common eye diseases that cause visual impairment in children. First one list is cortical visual impairment, also known as CVI. CVI is not a result of the eyes, but more of the connection between the brain communicating with the eyes. So this may not appear on an eye exam for a child, but there may be certain characteristics that may be displayed by the student. Retinopathy of prematurity or ROP is happens when babies are born prematurely and have abnormal blood vessel growth throughout their retina, just a part in the back of the eye. Optic nerve hypoplasia, or also known as OMH, is the underdevelopment of the optic nerve, which connects the eye to the brain. And this is how, how visual information is transmitted. Albinism is a genetic disorder that affects the pigmentation of the eyes, skin, and the hair. There is a risk of skin cancer for those with albinism, as well as photophobia, which is sensitivity to light. Glaucoma is there are different types of glaucoma and there's a range, but this is high pressure within your eye that can cause damage to the optic nerve. It can, it's a congenital, can be a gen, congenital disease, which means someone can be born with it and it usually runs within the family. There's a picture of a student getting an eye example from it. Here we have a picture of a student who is brailing um, we're going to talk about the educational team for students. So as you, you guys may be common, of course, with the people that are on the educational team. So I won't keep our explanations long, but of course we have our parent and our guardian, who's one of the most important members because that is your student, that is their child. Um, we have the teacher, the visually impaired, whom um, usually speaks with the general education or special education teacher about the concerns for the child or any accommodations or modifications that may be needed. And we'll see the children through either direct services or another type, which we'll get into later type of services. But this could maybe once a week for 30 minutes or something of that nature. Um, the general education or special education teacher usually talks, again, with the teacher of the visually impaired about anything that they may observe in the, in the classroom or if materials need to be uh, translated to Braille or if they need to be provided in large print. We also have evaluation specialists and psychologists. Additional members or related services may be added as well to your student's educational team, depending on their needs. 
We have an orientation and mobility specialist, which will be discussed further in this presentation. We also have an ABA or applied behavior analysis therapist. We have physical therapists that work closely as far as gross motor skills. We talk about things about um, balance or, or stair travel um, or contrast that may be needed when the student is traveling. Uh, we have occupational therapists that works with, that works on fine motor skills. Um, the occupational therapist and the teacher of the visually impaired um, develop a very close relationship as far as talking about fine motor skills when it comes to writing or if the student is a braille reader, um, developing great hand strength and dexterity because this is super important for our braille readers, as well as having a great grip if the student has a cane. We have a, a speech and language pathologist and a deaf and hard of hearing teacher that may be added as well to your student services. For service models, there are many different ways that a teacher with visual impairment can service students with visual impairments. We have, um, there can be a residential school for the blind, such as in Florida, there's the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind in St. Augustine. So this is where students will either stay for a, a day and go home just like school or either since residential stay Monday through Friday and go home on the weekends. But that school there, all the students there have a visual impairment. Uh, Center-based services such as like Miami Lighthouse Academy provide services for school Monday through Friday, Friday as well as supplemental services on the weekends, maybe Saturdays or during breaks such as winter break or spring break so where there may be more one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction with Braille or focus on daily living skills such as cooking or doing laundry or get the experience with career, um, uh, certain careers that they can explore after graduating. Itinerant services is the most common service for TBIs. Direct services, there could either be pull out or push in. So with pull out, the TBI takes the student somewhere else into another room to provide those services or push-ins when the TBI comes within the classroom and works with the student while the teacher is teaching. So for example, if the teacher is teaching reading, the, the TBI might help come in and, and do what needs to be done as far as maybe braille or large print. And consultative services, that's more of the TBI talking more with the special education teacher or the general education teacher and other services that the student may have instead of talking directly with the student and to see if there may be some changes or, or just you know what's going on with the student or checking in to see how they're doing. And there's a picture of a student who is reading Braille. So for our students with visual impairments, um, I briefly stated before, there is a range of visual impairments. So um, visual impairment is an umbrella term, but a child can, a student can range from total blindness all the way to low vision. So there is a difference. And even if a student has the same visual impairment, the services are not and accommodations are not always the same for that student. And uh, our students who have visual impairments may also have other disabilities. So these are our students with multiple disabilities. And that's when more team members are added to the child's educational team. And so there's more communication going on and there's more things that we may need to accommodate or modify. So I will pass it back, pass it on to Francesca. Thank you, Demi. So today we're gonna to talk about the role of the TBI in a little more depth. Um, and if you have a student in your classroom, it looks like we have quite a few of you who are working with students with visual impairments or whose work supports them. So. We'll talk a little bit about how you will interact or how uh, you will communicate with the TVI on that student's team. So first of all, the TVI is considered um, the central member on that educational team uh, responsible for assessment and then providing the education-based interventions to address that, that student's visual needs. Um, and so once the student is diagnosed, either from their optometrist, ophthalmologist, or low vision specialist, um, once they are diagnosed with a vision impairment, they would be assigned to receive a functional vision assessment and a learning media assessment um, known as FELMA or some the acronym you may see. And 
if the child has been diagnosed with CVI, as Demi was mentioning, uh, they would receive the CVI range assessment by a professional trained in the CVI range. And if they require independent orientation and mobility training, they would receive an O&M assessment. So assessment is really that first step. And during the assessment, uh, you will probably see the TVI observing. Um, observation is the key part, and we're looking to see how that student is using their vision in all parts of their day, walking through the hallways. So how are they traveling safely or where do they need assistance to travel more safely, more independently? We'll be observing how they are um, working in the classroom. So all, how are they interacting um, with all of their materials, their worksheets, their textbooks? Are they able to read the board? Um, if not, how are they receiving content that's written on the board? And so after the functional vision assessment, the learning media assessment determines how um, that student best learns. So what is their preferred uh, learning channel? If they, are, if they do have residual vision um, and they'll be using their vision, that student maybe will require large print or an audio supported device to support their reading when they're experiencing vision, visual fatigue, or they may be a tactual learner, so they'll be learning braille, um, or they may be auditory, um, or a combination. They can be a dual or multi-sensory learner. So determining how they learn um, will then allow us to design their accommodations and their modifications to their curriculum. Um, and also the instructional interventions that uh, Demi was talking about, how we would then provide our services to that student so they can thrive both in the classroom um, as well as at home and in the community. And so after um, the assessment stage, um, we would work really closely with the classroom teacher and some of their subject area teachers, um, their whole team to ensure that they're able to access every part of their day, just as their sighted peers. Um, so to ensure that they are um, receiving their materials in time, um, in the right format, and um, where they would need additional instruction, um, we would provide that. And so that individual instruction um, is in the form um, after providing the modifications to the general education curriculum, the TVI would then be implementing the expanded core curriculum, which we will talk a little bit more in depth later on in our presentation, but um, just briefly, the expanded core curriculum or ECC uh, is designed um, to, it's a dis disability specific set of skills that would compensate for uh, that student's vision loss um, in many foundational ways. So the role of the TVI um, is really critical in three specific phases um, of the student's life and their academic uh, career. They are early intervention, the school age services, and transition services. And so in early intervention, this is with, with children that are from birth to three years old, and it's designed to support the child um, in early development through play, building those sensory efficiency skills, fine and gross motor skills, um, usually through um, activities and play with their peers. And that would also include if they're going to be a Braille reader, um, we, do, we would use pre-Braille activities and building pre-Braille skills. Social skills are really important at this stage as well. Um, and so building that interaction, um, encouraging them to interact with their peers that um, you know, they, we facilitate that um, interaction and that social, social development. And so as Ms. Demi was describing, our services for school-age students would range from age three to age 21. And um, this is really a critical time, as we know, um, to ensure that the student is accessing and um, able to 
access their curriculum in literacy, uh, in technology skill building, in all parts of their curriculum. And so, um, you know, if a student is totally blind and is, you know, comes into fifth grade or fourth grade and there's a challenging subject, um, something like geometry, which is, you know, very visual, the TVI and the geometry teacher would work together, developing ways um, that those 3D models or that 3D models could be available um, to support that student and the visual concepts that their sighted peers are learning at that time. So in transition services, um, transition services can occur between um, to moving into kindergarten or moving from high school into college. So those are two key transitions for all students, um, but especially for our students with visual impairments. And it's so critical, um, especially for our high school students to identify those areas if they, if they exist, um, where, they are, where there are limitations or where they could um, benefit from more skill building. And so we talk about college readiness, job and career readiness, and independence um, to build that lifestyle where they can um, achieve their, their goals, both in an academic setting and careers. And so this is a goal that is absolutely within reach. And I think, I think we all agree that with that collective um, goal with teachers and parents and the student, together, those transitions can be made uh, much more um, simpler. So the expanded core curriculum, as I was starting to say, is in addition to the general education curriculum. And so the ECC uh, provides those additional nine elements that have been designed uh, to provide growth and development in areas that the student with visual impairments may not be incidentally learning through vision. And you know, for TVIs especially, the ECC is our most comprehensive guide to instruction. It's a very uh, expansive, a very impressive curriculum. Uh, and it's so exciting to teach because it allows us to build independence and assistive technology skills and career building and, and really get to watch our students come alive um, through these lessons. So the nine elements I have on the slide, um, the skills would be in compensatory areas, assistive technology, independent living skills, social interaction skills, self-determination or self-advocacy skills, sensory efficiency skills, career education, recreation and leisure skills, and orientation mobility skills. And so I'll just focus briefly on two fundamental um, elements of the ECC, uh, independent living skills and self-determination or self-advocacy skills. And so independent living skills, we know, um, you know, being independent starts from the moment we get up in the morning till the moment we hit the pillow at the end of the day. I think independence and building that confidence and in being independent is so critical to our students' development. Are they able, or the skills that we would be building are stepping off the bus, feeding themselves appropriately, um, getting self hygiene skills and being able to do that independently. Eventually, um, you know, dressing, self-dressing, clothing, um, you know, cleaning their space, their room, things like that. And so the bottom line here is, you know, making sure that they will not need to rely on others, a family member, a teacher, but they can do these tasks for themselves, which really builds confidence and self-respect. The second I wanted to just touch on is self-determination or self-advocacy. And this is really critical uh, for our students to build that confidence as well, um, to, to build uh, self-awareness and a sense of self so that they're able to be effective self-advocates for their own needs. Um, and so encouraging them to 
eventually understand and be able to support um, themselves and their needs, explain to their teacher, you know, when something is not accessible so that they can, um, you know, have that material, whether it's a worksheet or not being able to see the board, um, you know, using their voice to, to really um, support themselves and their own needs. So compensatory skills is one of the most comprehensive of the elements of the ECC because it, uh, it encompasses everything, how they are learning, um, how they're receiving their materials and also how they are producing their academic materials. So you can think of it as how are they reading and how are they writing? Um, and so, you know, these skills do begin in the classroom, absolutely. Um, but they also will continue to be valuable skills throughout their lives. And so the compensatory skills are really informed by our initial assessments, the functional vision or the learning media assessment so that we can determine as we talked about how are they best learning and how are they using their vision or their other senses to access the curriculum. Um, and so we are looking at, are they a visual auditory or tactual learner? Do they use two of those media? Maybe they use their vision, but they also use audio supports. Maybe they use, uh, maybe they're a tactual learner and they'll be learning braille and their materials would need to be in braille and build braille literacy. Or are they a multi-sensory learner receiving or producing material best through two or more, two or three different learning channels? Um, and so once we determine how, where they are in their compensatory skill development, uh, we're able to provide instructional intervention to make sure they are building that literacy at grade level. And so compensatory skills is also an area of the ECC where TVIs and the classroom teacher or their other teachers in the school really collaborate and should interact um, closely because getting those materials, if things need to be adapted or modified or you know, a worksheet needs to be transcribed so that that student can also interact with it. The TVI can get it in time and the student could have it in time to participate um, actively in class. Um, and so just a couple examples, um, you know, if a student is having difficulty, let's say they are a visual learner and they have a desktop magnifier in their class and they might be learning how to navigate that, you know, for different worksheets or for using their textbook or finding, you know, the picture on the page. The classroom teacher might notice that and be able to share that information with the TBI so they can further um, intervene, give them extra training to allow them to be comfortable with that, excuse me, with that device. And, you know, this is really such a key, key part of how uh, compensatory skills should be assessed, reassessed um, over time, just constantly ensuring that the student is accessing their materials best. Um, and as Virginia mentioned at the beginning, you know, these are other ways um, that students learn. They are doing things just a little differently, um, but they're still access, able to access um, if we provide those materials. And so the last part of the ECC that I wanted to touch on because it's so dynamic um, and constantly changing and exciting is assistive technology. Um, and so this is really how our students are gaining the skills that they'll need to use computers, um, to other, all other electronic equipment to function independently and effectively at home or school or eventually at work. And so, you know, Technology we know is rapidly changing. Um, we know for our students that technology is such a huge integral part to how they learn. And so ensuring the TVI would be ensuring that our students have access, have the training they need to use those devices um, at the same 
speed that their sighted peers are using them. Um, you know, iPad, iPhone, keyboards, that all starts at such a young age now. And so we want to build our students access to the same technology. On the screen, um, you see a picture of a refreshable Braille device. And so two really um, incredible pieces of technology that we have for our students now um, is the Braille Note Touch Plus, which is an incredible device. It uses refreshable Braille technology, um, but it also allows the student to um, access the internet, access email, learn how to compose and read email, use a Google Calendar for scheduling and you know, gaining that independence in their own schedule and routine. Um, they can produce words in a word processor, just like their sighted peers on a computer screen with a Word document. And EI Braille, which is the image in this picture, um, is another refreshable Braille display, and it runs um, with Windows 10, also allowing that student to read and write, um, read and produce their materials at um, a rapid speed to be um, to stay, stay um, at the same speed as their sighted peers. And so depending on the student's needs, um, some will require screen magnifiers. So they'll require that the writing on the screen is large or maybe using a different contrast. They may prefer having um, bold white letters on black background or black bold letters on white background or yellow letters. Um, the screen reading software and screen um, magnification have those options that our students can choose their preferred um, format. And so that might be the screen magnification, then there's screen reading software, which is an audio um, output of what is on the screen. And so your students that would be using or utilizing something like JAWS or NVDA, a non-visual desktop access, they may be using headphones um, in the class so that they can hear and follow along um, to what their peers are reading on the computer screen. And so um, at the, you know, for instance, at the Miami Lighthouse, we have these devices that we are able to train our students, um, you know, have them feel comfortable with a device either on weekends or in the summer before they start their next year so that they can, they can have that opportunity to engage with the technology um, that their peers are. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So right now we're going to discuss orientation mobility. Firstly, let's start off, what is an orientation mobility specialist? This is orientation mobility specialist is an individual, is a professional who has the training and skills to teach individuals who are visually impaired in the, on how to travel independently in different types of environments. So they could be indoor environments. So for instance, a, a school setting, being able to orient a person uh, to the classroom, how to get around the classroom, the location of the exits, the cubbies, where the teacher sits. Furthermore, it could be how to navigate then the, ca the campus, being able to travel to the lunchroom, to the bathroom, to different types of classes. And then as the student ages, it becomes community travel, being able to travel on a sidewalk, cross street safely, take public transportation safely, and then ultimately travel independently in college and in their careers. I wanna break down the statement orientation mobility first. What is orientation? That's the, that's the ability to be able to update, spatially update and know where you are in an environment, where are you going in an environment, and how are you going to get there? The ability to spatially update, for instance, meaning you're now in front of a classroom, the classroom is on your side, and now you're walking past it, and now the classroom is behind you. It's the ability to create a mental map of an area. So being able to understand the layout of a particular hallway. For instance, a hallway is an L-shaped hallway. In the picture over here on the slide, we have a picture of a student uh, who's holding a long white cane at the Miami Lighthouse, and this student is learning orientation mobility skills. One of the first skills that we teach is the human guide technique. This, is, this technique is taught because it is, firstly, you don't need to be visually impaired in order to use, be a human guide. 
Secondly, it is one of the first techniques we teach because a student learning this technique can now travel independent with, with a level of independence in the environment. So by independence, I mean the student in this technique is holding on to their guide. They're not being held on to, which is, which is a key difference. At any point, this student can let go of their guide and decide that they want to interact with their environment. For instance, you're walking past a soda machine. The student wants to go ahead and get something from the soda machine. They can let go of their guide and, and, and interact with that machine, as opposed to being held onto and not having that freedom to go a, and away from that guide. The other portion of, of this technique is being able to be descriptive in language when using human guide technique. So the person guiding should use specific language, such as left or right. Um, using cardinal directions such as north or south or clockwise directions such as the item is at 12 o'clock at six o'clock at three o'clock or at nine o'clock using omnidirectional terms like over there over here that doesn't provide any information for a student who is being guided uh, the long way came firstly for, for individuals who are visually impaired this is a tool this is a powerful tool and it's a symbol of independence uh, the long way cane provides information firstly to the community and the people around the person using the long way cane that the person has a visual impairment. Not all students who have a, a visual impairment use a long way cane. There's different types of canes out there, such as ID canes that just merely identify the student, or the student may choose not to use a long way cane, which is a decision between the student, the student's parents, and uh, the orientation mobility instructor. Um, so the long way cane helps detect drop offs such as stairs, locating that first stair or a curb. It helps detect elevation changes uh, or different types of texture changes within the environment. Nextly, the, the guide dogs. Guide dogs are, you know, for, for an individual to, re to receive a guide dog, they must receive orientation mobility instruction. Guide dogs are different than the long way cane as they are obstacle avoiders while a cane is an obstacle detector. It's important to note that, uh, that you know, a guide dog is an animal and if a student should uh, use a guide dog and not be able to, you know, the guide dog is not feeling well one day, they have their long white cane skills to fall back on. Typically accredited guide, dog, guide dogs are provided after high school. But in the event that a senior in a high school should receive a guide dog, it is important to note to interact directly with the student and not with the guide dog. To distract the guide dog is to, uh, is to go ahead and put the entire team in danger. Uh, it's important that you don't pet the guide dog, when, especially when the guide dog is wearing their harness. One thing you might notice is if a student removes the harness from a guide dog, that guide dog then may become more playful because the guide dog knows when, when it's not wearing that harness, it's not working. But the second that harness goes on the guide dog, it is now working. So a poll question, what comes to mind when you hear the term legal blindness? Apologies for a delay all. I seem to be having a technical difficulty. Let's see, instead of, uh, instead of the poll, if you could type in the chat, what comes to mind when you hear the term legal blindness? Feel free to let us know. That can be anything you think of, whether that's full sightedness, um, partial loss of vision. What are some things that you might think of? Sandy shared that um, that term doesn't reveal anything about how one particular person might function. Um, Lorraine shared very limited vision. similar terms, feel free to add in um, your answers, low vision, ranging to no sight at all. So it kind of encompasses a broad scope from what people think of. And Gabrielle, are people still uh, writing in the chat room? Uh, another person shared low or, low or no vision at all. 
Yeah, that seems to be the kind of idea that there's a range of sorts. Um, one person shared very little vision at the very least. So yeah, all these answers kind of encompass a, a range of vision it, encompassed in this term. I'll pass it back to Florian. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, so the legal blindness is a spectrum. And we're, what I'm gonna go ahead and highlight right now is a low vision simulator. This simulator is going to highlight glaucoma or retinitis pigmentosa, which have similar uh, ways, the way they manifest themselves. And I'm using an application known as Via Opta Simulator by Novartis in order to go ahead and show this uh, vision simulator. I'm going to begin the vision simulator right now. So right now what's happening is these are the early on stages of, of glaucoma where the lower peripheral field right now is occluded. Um, the, the central vision is for the most part we could see intact over here. We could see that the first step is beginning to look a little uh, blurry as I'm looking down a stairwell. This stairwell does have contrast luckily for me at this point. Now, as the condition progresses, what happens is the peripheral field begins to shrink on the upper, lower, uh, and left and right sides. So I can no longer see where that first step is. In order for me to see where that first step is, I have to look down. And that is the only way I know where that first step is. While I'm looking down, I don't have any situational awareness on what's going on. I don't know if there's a person coming at me. I don't know if there's anything in the environment. And then the disease begins to progress even more where even the stairs now look like a slide. I could still see out of my central vision, but the peripheral vision is so compromised that I, I cannot see anything in the environment. Now, what will help in this situation is the use of a long white cane. If, if somebody has vision that has, somebody's glaucoma or retinitis pigmentosa has progressed to this point, a long white cane will help that person determine if there's a drop off in front of them. As the person goes, uh, descends the stairs, it'll provide them with foot placement preview, informing them that yes, there is another step. There is another step until their cane reaches the landing. At that point, the person knows that they have to negotiate another step and then they are at the landing. But that just demonstrates the spectrum of vision loss and the powerful tool that a long white cane could be in this kind of instance. The Miami Lighthouse provides uh, the power of a holistic approach. Early intervention is important for, it, for uh, students bo born visually impaired, and especially for parents to begin to learn what support systems are available. Uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy work very closely with orientation mobility in order to help adapt uh, long white canes and work on student balance to help them negotiate an environment. Counseling and pre-employment services are extremely important in order to help students be able to cope with any emotional, uh, any emotional difficulties that they may be going through and in order to help prepare them for, for the future in looking for their careers. The benefits of an inclusive model are emotional and behavior support exceeded the national average on the classroom assessment scoring system. Students demonstrated learning gains from fall to spring in COR developmental skills positive changes in peer relationships and empathetic behaviors observed by both teachers and parents. So some key takeaways from, today, from today's presentation. Vision loss is a spectrum. You can have some, some with low vision and some using a long white cane to travel. It's important to note that the, the two people may have the same diagnosis but use their vision quite differently. Collaborate, collaboration and communication are key elements of all members on the student's educational team. It's important to address the progress, discuss issues, and reinforce development, development between lessons. And it's also important to inform parents. One thing in my experience that, that I've noticed, is, especially from orientation mobility, is students receive O&M in school and parents might not understand the different O&M concepts. So one thing that I'd like, I'd like to do is communicate with parents on exactly what I'm doing with students in school. So this way they can reinforce those skills at home and in the community. Uh, students with the same vision may, may not require the same types of, of accommodations and modifications. Every student is unique, and so their plan must be approached as an individual. A certified TVI is a teacher that provides accommodations and modifications for students with visual impairments to access the general curriculum. 
a certified orientation mobility specialist helps a student learn how to travel safely in their environment and negotiate familiar and unfamiliar settings. And a student who is visually impaired can do anything a sighted peer can do, uh, they just may do it differently. Uh, to contact the Miami Lighthouse, you can contact us at 786-362-7483 or at www.miamilighthouse.org. And now we can open it up for some questions. Yes, thank you so, so much. I love covering those, <clears throat> excuse me, those key takeaways um, and also just the, the benefits of an inclusive model like the changes in, in peer relationships. It's always great to hear that the students themselves are showing that positive change and that the parents and teachers are noticing. Um, but yeah, like Florian said, we are open to any questions. So if you would like, you're welcome to type in the chat um, or you can unmute yourself and ask anyone on the panel um, questions. I know that there was typed in um, earlier in the chat during your portion, Francesca, around the TVI assessment. Um, was there a particular name of that assessment that you mentioned? Uh, yes, so it's called the CVI range assessment. And I believe I did send a message to uh, Ms. Carol Higa or Higa. Oh, so if anyone has any further questions about that, please feel free. Yes. So we are open. Um, I know that there was, um, we did of course open for questions in the registration form. Um, and so one question, maybe even Virginia could speak to as well, is around, um, you know, for either maybe a, a public school setting, the, the person didn't specify in their question, but either at a public school or a charter school, what do you think are some of the first steps that teachers should take, um, you know, when they're working with students who might be blind or visually impaired, but haven't worked with those students previously? Uh, throughout the United States, there are entities called lighthouses. We are all a separate independent corporation, but back in the days of Helen Keller, she liked Lighthouse, House of Light, and the New York Lighthouse began, the Chicago Lighthouse, the Miami Lighthouse for the Blind, now nearly 100 years of service to the blind. So those types of entities, and they can help provide advice. At the same time, in the public school system, there are, like in Miami-Dade schools, employees that are called Florida Licensed Teachers of the Visually Impaired. So a teacher of the visually impaired is so very important. And it begins with a collaboration. Some charter schools, but not very many, have a teacher of the visually impaired on a consultative service. So we do consult with charter schools in providing some of the services that need to be provided by a Florida licensed teacher of the visually impaired. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. That is very helpful. Thank you for speaking to that. And so I don't know if there are too many questions that people have. I know we covered a lot in this session. Um, so there doesn't seem to be too many more. Um, but in that case, that does conclude the session for today. So of course on the screen, like Florian mentioned, you can always go to miamilighthouse.org for more information on the work they're doing. Um, I know they have some continuous resources that they're creating and sharing, um, as well as events such as this one. Uh, and the same thing for ELA, we're at educatingalllearners.org, um, where we love to spotlight work, spotlight work um, such as this. So thank you all so, so much for joining us. Um, that does conclude the webinar for today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, you all. We hope to see you soon.